and uh, go ahead and get started. All right, thank you very much, Ken. Uh, this talk is going to be on gray line propagation, or a specific case of it, uh, Florida Cocos Keeling on 80 meters. Uh, this will be essentially a case study of uh, a presentation that Carl K9 LA uh, uh, made uh, about six months ago on on the subject of gray line propagation. But this is an actual specific case of it and uh, some work we did uh, once uh, once the magic event happened. So uh, for just some make sure everybody is up to words on on terminology here. The antipode, of course, is the spot on the Earth, the opposite on the, on the opposite side from where you are. Uh, in this case, uh, on the club station I was at, November 4, Bravo Radio Fox, at that the uh, in Boca Raton, Florida, and so its antipode is shown there is off the western coast of Australia, and that's going to have a lot to do with uh, things as they unfold. So the Southeast uh, Indian Ocean has uh, Cocos Keeling, of course, VK9C, and VK9X, uh, Christmas Island, uh, Diego Garcia, VQ9. And the interesting part is the antipode in 4 brf which is in the middle of the ocean, 17,000 feet deep. And uh, the nearest land is uh, Dirk Hartog Island, which is OC206. And I'm still waiting to be around when somebody activates OC206. I would really like to get that one. But I um, just want to talk about the, the keep in mind the relationship between uh, the N4BRF antipode and VK9C Chris, or uh, Cocos Keeling. So Cocos Keeling is the farthest DXCC entity from South Florida. It's 11,450 miles, uh, just about 1,000 miles away from the antipode. And in largely April 2013, uh, Chris and Keith, uh, GM3WOJ and GM3YXI, uh, ran a de-expedition there as VK9 Charlie Zulu. And they were, for low band purposes, they were really great. They would alternate between 80 and 160 every sunrise and sunset uh, beginning on the 3rd. And they were on 80 meters exclusively after the, the 6th of April. Um, production on 160 was, was uh, too poor to keep it going. So this is the antenna that they had. Um, a note I got from Keith says, top-loaded T-vertical, it's right there on the, on the water. And uh, they were running about 400 watts. And you see the note there, he's, he, uh, the sea path ran from about 150 degrees to 330 degrees. And that's uh, something also to keep in mind. So they had a, the, the sea, uh, had about 150 to about 330 degrees. So it was, as he says, great for a long path to North America. The only disadvantage, I think, is this 300 foot long feed line. So when they announced their de-expedition, I said, boy, I want to have a shot at working these guys on 80 meters. And so um, the plan to work them was, of course, to find the time of mutual darkness. And so I looked at their sunset, and their sunset was at 11.32, but my sunrise was at 11.06. So I'm, I couldn't, ha couldn't do that one, but uh, their sunrise was at 23.37, and my sunset was essentially the same time. So we didn't have any mutual darkness, but we did have this gray line possibility right when their sunrise and, and my sunset uh, occurred at essentially the same time. And because I live in South Florida at a, uh, a uh, restricted area, I have to use a club station. And the Boca Raton club station was the best station available to me at the time. Uh, it's located out in a, in a swamp area outside of town. And they have uh, a pretty good radial system underneath the vertical. And we had about a 500 watt PA. Uh, at the time, we didn't have any internet out there. That's since been corrected, though. So that's, that was the plan. 
So on the 3rd of April, I began monitoring them, uh, ADCW at 2300. Now, that's 40 minutes before uh, my sunset. And sure enough, 25 minutes after then, and on into the waiting period, there they were. They popped up as if somebody just flicked on a switch calling CQ. And there was no pileup. I worked them on the first call. They called CQ again. There was no pileup. I decided to use the club's call just to get the club credit because, after all, it was their equipment. And they called CQ again and again. And they would work, you know, maybe one or two people. And then they faded at 2345, which was just after my sunset and eight minutes after their sunrise. And I was just flabbergasted at how easy that was. It was. It was literally. Hi, here's a signal guy calling CQ. Answer him and work him. It was just, it was just stunning. So I decided to hang around and listen and see what happened on the, the other nights. And so on the fourth they were going to be on 160, but on the fifth they're going to be back on 80 meters. Unfortunately, on the fifth of April there was a large thunderstorm that sat over us. So I stayed off the air and was tremendously frustrated. Better safe than sorry. So two days later on the 7th, essentially we had a repeat of the situation. I uh, heard them calling CQ. There was no pile again. They were literally as if they were um, just uh, some, you know, the Bahamas or some very uh, close DX station. There was never a, a real pileup. There was just, you know, a few callers. They were plenty strong, easy to work, and they faded uh, 10 minutes after sunset and 13 minutes after their sunrise. It was uh, really a magical thing. And this made such an impression on me that I w couldn't figure out how, how this happened. You know, where, where was the giant pileup that I expected had to be there for people who wanted to work Cocos Keeling from North America on 80 meters? You know, you know, I was expecting to have a real dogfight and to, frankly, not be successful. So what the heck was going on? I was really puzzled. And it would have stayed that way, except the following week, the ARL propagation bulletin came out. And it had this little note written in from AC4G in Tennessee. And he wrote in that said he was so excited to QSO VK9 Charlie Zulu on 80 meter CW that I had to write in. And apparently right after the time he faded from here at 2345, uh, he worked him in Tennessee. And that's even more f fascinating because Tennessee is west of us and they must have been in sunlight at the same time the, the uh, the guys in Cocos Keeling were in sunlight. So that was just fabulous. So that sort of lit the fire underneath me, and I said, well, we've got to figure out what's going on here. So after the expedition ended, I contacted uh, the South Florida DX Association and the Florida uh, contest group uh, email reflectors, and I asked for information from others in Florida. You know, did, did you work? Uh, the Cocos Keeling, the expedition, what, did, what experience did you have? And basically everybody else felt the same way. It was, wow, that, that was fabulous. And I looked at the club log data, and there were 51 contacts made with U.S. Zone 5. So the Florida contacts were unexpectedly large, even, even assuming our, our large population. So that was interesting. Um, Kai Siwi at KE4PT made the, in hindsight, very rational suggestion. We'll look at the spots and see what you can learn from them. And the spots were really intriguing for several reasons. Um, the ones from you know, in the southeast were all within this very small eight-minute window over, over the uh, eight days. and Intriguing especially was one from W1QS who has uh, a note that, number one, he 
could hear them in Maine. That was in, in and of itself interesting. And number two, there were signals coming in from the southeast 449. So that was, that was an, an intriguing note. And I sent out of all the, the email responders, uh, Pete, N8PR, was the only one that replied that had a directional antenna system 180 meters. And he said he heard them best when he was pointed into the southwest, or uh, specifically, better yet, on his Waller flag that was pointed to the south-southwest. And this really puzzled me because south-southwest from here at that time of day is into daylight. And how one makes a contact halfway around the world on 80 meters by pointing into the daylight was not intuitively obvious to the casual observer, at least to this casual observer. I couldn't figure out what the heck had happened. So, as often happens when I can't figure out these things, I uh, gave Carl K9LA a, a quiz and said, what the heck? And uh, he asked and received the VK9 Charlie Zulu 80 meter log. And it had a whole bunch of really interesting things in it. Um, there were 108 contacts with the US. There was zero in Canada. That, that was the first interesting thing. Secondly, there were evenly split sunrise and sunset. And Carl looked up each station's contact or East Station's QTH and build a spreadsheet of the contact date, the time, and the state that it was in. And then he sent me that anonymized spreadsheet. So at the time, I did not know uh, any of the uh, the stations themselves that were that were worked by uh, the VK9. But still, there was plenty of interesting things one can learn. Um, in the you look at the U.S., this is the breakdown of contacts uh, made by VK9 Charlie Zulu uh, by state. And you can see on the east side that um, 21 are in Florida, and the next highest is 7 in Pennsylvania. There's a whole bunch of 1s and 2s, including the AC4G in, in Tennessee, the very, very lucky AC4G. It turns out he's on the Tennessee-Alabama border, and it was an incredible contact. Um, interestingly enough, there were four in Maine, so that was that was also interesting. Um, on this map, I have put a, a line of meridian, which is the longitude of the antipode of VK9 Charlie Zulu. So that's the that's the uh, if you slice the Earth in half and put uh, uh, Coco's Keeling on on one side. This line, this is where the line would be on the other side when you slit the when they slit the world in half. So they actually made a few contacts more than 180 degrees around the Earth. You know, the the contacts in Alabama and Tennessee, in particular, were were done all the way around the world long ways. Interestingly, there's a, a dead zone in the middle. And then there's a, a zone where uh, people made their contacts in the morning in the in the U.S. time, uh, you know, Texas and moving out west. Um, but I wanted to look in particular at the uh, at the contacts in the east half of the country because the by the time you get that that far away from the meridian, you start you don't have true uh, gray line propagation. And so I wanted to stay and study the actual gray line case, which is uh, what we were experiencing on the on the East Coast. So I did something I'd never seen before, which is I, I organized the states east to west. And of course, it's not perfect because you know no no uh, there are plenty of states that are both east and west of some other point on some other state. But uh, it's a pretty it's a reasonable. Uh, effort at it. And you could see that there were southern states were clearly favored. And there was also this one case of the a guy in Kentucky that made a 
contact at sunrise. And the question was whether that was a real contact, uh, whether there was some, you know, a short between the headphones somewhere, or maybe there was a, uh, he was using a remote station, whatever the case may be. Um, uh, Carl emailed him but did not get a response. And there's also one station with a question mark here that turned out to be a busted call. Uh, at least a busted call, meaning it's not in QRZ.com. So. so, but it's still, it's interesting to see this is, this is where the, the station is lined up. The duration is also interesting. It's just one thing that, that cements the idea that we were experiencing on the East Coast true gray line propagation is the shortness of the, of the openings. Uh, they're much shorter on the East Coast than they were on, on the West. And this is, this is done by taking the, the times any time during that week and taking the, the difference between the minimum and the maximum times. So this is the, the maximum times on any given opening. So there, you can see in uh, Oregon, there's some lucky guys that had a, an opening of an hour and a half. But on the East Coast, we were looking at just a very few minutes. Um, the fascinating thing to me about the main opening is that that's over four days. I'm sorry, yes, over there were four contacts in Maine, and the four on four different days they each made contact within a six minute window of each other. So there literally was a magic moment when they they had the path and then they lost it again. So it was a it was a fascinatingly brief opening. So I asked Carl for his opinion, and of course he offered several points that I thought were were worth remembering. Uh, the first one was that. Um, when we use uh, directional receive antennas, we're optimizing signal-to-noise ratio and not uh, the signal itself. This means we have a bias that towards the sun side of the terminator, the terminator being the, the line between uh, the day and the night, or the night and the day. Um, when we have um, a receive antenna, we typically will want to bias it a little bit towards the sun side of the terminator because there's less noise coming from that way, from that direction. And so there will be a better signal to noise ratio than uh, if you slide the antenna a little bit over towards the sun side than if you uh, aimed it directly at the, the, um, the station you're trying to receive. This is especially true if the true direction the signal is coming from is almost uh, the same direction as the terminator. So as we say in here, the, at sunset the signal may be coming from the south-southeast, but the best signal to noise ratio may be found when your the antenna is pointed to the south or maybe even the south-southwest. And this is a note to remember that then the optimum directions for low band transmit and receive antennas may in fact be different. So here's just a, a graph of the or a graphical description of the situation. So on transmit, you know, here's the terminator with day on one side and night on the other. And for transmitting, if you want to transmit to a DX station that's let's say in the southeast, uh, you just point it at point it right at him. You get the best signal at his other end. And uh, in the receive case, however, there is going to be less noise coming from the left side because that's the day side. And so there will tend to be a bias of the heading of the receive antenna. You get better signal to noise if you tend to bias that a little bit off to the, in this case, towards the left, towards, towards the sun side. second point Carl had to offer was that propagation directly along the terminator is really unlikely and even if it does happen it would be really lossy and the reason it's unlikely is because you're in a situation where you've got a lot of ionization on one 
on horizontally on one side and less on the other. So you got more ionization on the sun side because it's being irradiated and you have less on the night side. And that's essentially taking if, you know, the standard ionospheric model and turning it over on its side. Um, a signal that approaches uh, the terminator is going to refract away from the terminator. So the force is going to force the signal away from the sun side into the dark uh, ionosphere. And with that also, you're going to have uh, increased absorption, increased attenuation compared to the, the dark side because of the, the uh, high ionization levels that, that close to, uh, to the sun uh, insulation. So instead of uh, trying to t get a signal that leaves uh, Florida and, and moves right down the, the terminator, there's going to be a, a natural bending, a refraction of the signal that's going to force it out into uh, the darkness away from the, the, uh, the, the uh, ionization of the, of the daylight. And it's also the case that it's nearly always, almost certain now that the duct between the E and the F layers is what is driving low band propagation. Um, once people started to look at this from a, a quantitative viewpoint and started counting up decibels, it became very clear that you, you couldn't do a conventional uh, HF type of uh, ground to ionosphere hop and, and make it all the way across the other side of the world. It's just, it's just too much loss. But you can put some in a signal in the duct and uh, the ionospheric tilt at sunrise and sunset uh, enables the signal to get in the duct and it can get out of the duct anytime the E layer has any kind of in, in homogeneity, any kind of a hole, anything that's not uh, totally uniform on the underside. And to give you an idea what's looking at what looking at is that this is a, a graph taken from uh, NN7M's uh, paper in uh, QEX a while back. This is the y-axis is altitude, so this is just height above the Earth. And on the x-axis is the electrons per cubic meter, otherwise called ionization. And so right at the terminator, you see you've got this, uh, you've got the E layer and then you've got the F layer, and there's a small little uh, weak spot in here. But at midnight, you've got this very uh, low amount of ionization. And if you go down a little further, you get a very uh, well-defined peak of ionization in the E layer. And of course, the F layer uh, has a lot of ionization, and so you're in this. You can create this little duct that's about you know 60 kilometers wide, where it's low ionization here. And if I go higher, I get increased ionization. And if I go lower, I get increased ionization. And so if a signal is inside this area right in here in this duct, any time a signal goes high, it gets refracted back down, and any time it goes low, it gets refracted back up, and so it can stay in that duct and travel a long distance. And that's the present theory about how these these types of very long uh, propagation on the low bands occur. So I uh, went to the extreme of getting uh, a copy of PropLab Pro 3, and I played around with uh, uh, ducting on uh, 80 meters, and this is a case that we're going to talk about a little bit later, but um, a case leaving Florida at an elevation of 11 degrees off the, off the horizon, 11 degrees up, and then it's at an azimuth of 150 degrees, so this is pointed east, uh, south, southeast. And if I do that, I get a single E-layer hop, and then the signal pops into this duct, and it pops into the duct, and it stays a long time. And The scale here is in thousands of kilometers, and so it runs out you know, past 12,000 kilometers. This is a very long uh, duct. We'll talk about 
about this some more, this example. So you can see where it leaves the, at the uh, South Florida right here and makes one e-layer hop and lands almost right on top of Guantanamo Bay and then uh, heads into the, into the uh, duct and remains in the duct all the way down uh, into the uh, South Atlantic. The fourth point Carl pointed out was that if you want low loss propagation, it really should occur far away from the sun. Um, so there's little absorption. You don't want, you don't want to have absorption. The, the trouble is that you're 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 always fighting these weak signals, and so if you want to have uh, the best chance of getting signal through, it's got to be somewhere in the uh, in the dark ionosphere. And of course, the long-standing problem with this is that if you take the great circle route, otherwise, you know, the short path or the long path uh, between, in this case, uh, South Florida and Cocos Keeling, that route doesn't cross the dark ionosphere, but it's right near the terminator on both sides. Uh, it doesn't go where you need it to go in order to make it happen. So in order to make a, a path go through the dark ionosphere, you'd have to have something that left uh, the signal. The signal would leave uh, Florida on a, on a great circle and then somehow get refracted or bent or scattered or by some means moved onto a great circle that would put it, bring it back into Cocos Keeling. And of course the question is, what? Because we're left with cases, you know, if you look at the, the short path great circle route, um, goes through the high attenuation of the northern auroral oval and disagrees with both N8PR and W1QS uh, beam headings, which were pointed to the south. So that's really improbable. And then there's the even more improbable straight long path, which would take you in the sun all day long, so we can eliminate that one. And as we mentioned earlier, the path along the terminator is really unlikely. So that's left us with needing a third uh, possibility. And this is, uh, if you go back and uh, watch uh, Carl's presentation. This is, this is his uh, idea gussied up with some, a pretty picture, but um, I think this is actually what's happening. So a signal leaves South Florida here at about 150 degrees, somewhere south, southeast. And if it stayed on that path all the way through the blue path, uh, like all great circle routes, it would eventually end up at its antipode. But we're trying to find a method that will actually get it over here to Cocos Keeling. And so the theory is that what's happening is it goes into this duct and near the poles it gets runs into the auroral ionization, the same thing that has been, you know, that would attenuate the signal if you tried to go right through it. And so these, uh, these polar uh, uh, ovals of ionization. And, you know, if, if you think about ionization, as the signal runs up to this ionization, it's essentially like the signal is running up into just a conventional, you know, uh, ionospheric hop, you know, it's, it's, it's running into an area of, of increased ionization. And so what happens when a signal runs into an area of increased ionization? It refracts or bends away from it again. I mean, that's, that's basic how the ionosphere works. So only this time it's horizontal instead of vertical. So what the signal does is it bends off of that blue route and it bends just a few degrees. I mean, these are these are almost tangent lines here, just a few degrees, 
and ends up on a great circle route going to Cocos Keeling. And it approaches Cocos Keeling at about 205 degrees. And it turns out, if you remember the uh, slide with the antenna, the, the uh, location uh, the guys were at in Cocos Keeling had 205 degrees open to the sea. So they could, they, their antenna was very efficient looking at uh, a signal coming from an angle of 205 degrees. Similarly, when they transmitted, their signal would do the same thing in reverse. It would hit the ionization and it would refract away from the ionization just a little bit, but that's all it takes to get up to South Florida. So just to uh, put things into text, um, signal leaves South Florida at sunset, enters that duct on a great circle route that's close to the south southeast. It then approaches the auroral oval at a relatively small angle. It's, it's going to be almost tangential. And the ionization there closes the duct. The duct uh, pinches off there. And this ionization also refracts the signal onto a new great circle route that's bending towards the equator. It's bending it away. Uh, and in this case, it's bending it northward. Uh, it's still stuck in the duct, but it's bending it northward. And then that signal goes along until it uh, exits the, the duct uh, right at sunrise in Cocos Keeling. And so I think that's what's going on. Now, one of the uh, most interesting, I uh, don't know if I can call it, uh, well, so let's say factors that support the theory is that um, I looked up the International Reference Ionosphere model. The International Reference Ionosphere is a mathematical model. It's not measured data, but it's a model of the ionosphere. And uh, intriguingly, it does exactly what you would think. It comes, the, the duct itself is about 65 kilometers wide until you get right to the, uh, the uh, poles, to the, uh, the uh, ionization of the aurora, and then it, a, the width of the duct rapidly disappears. And the curve down below here is the ratio of minimum to maximum ionization, and, um, which means as the duct goes away, that number should approach one. And so you see that you see it as the as the signal approximate uh, approaches the 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 poles, the uh, ionization becomes almost the same, meaning there's no duct. So the the ionis the the duct seems to do uh, what we need it to do in order to get this uh, behavior. So what I think is happening is that we're taking this pathway down to the southern auroral oval, and it's taking a, in, my, in our case here in South Florida, it's taking a single E-layer hop. It's getting launched in the duct, and about 12,000 miles away, it hits the auroral oval. And then on the other half of the case, we have the Cocos Keeling case. And in Cocos Keeling, uh, the signal is sitting here from the auroral oval, stuck in the duct. And then right at sunrise, it comes out of the duct and drops back down to Cocos Keeling Island. And that's what I think is going on. I agree with uh, that this, this theory seems to fit all of the data. Intriguingly, it also has some prediction values that have been observed. In uh, particular, it's the only theory for this that I know of that explains why um, it's always southeast at sunset and southwest at sunrise. You know, the, the uh, low band operators are well aware of that, but this theory explains why that is. Um, if you take a 
route to the north and you say, okay, I'm going to take my blue uh, N4BRF signal and I'm going to push it up into the north here somewhere. Well, that has to get on a great circle route that takes it to Cocos Keeling Island, which is the red line. That has to get on that great circle. And so from the from the uh, South Florida, it has to go, it has to be bent towards the pole, not to the equator, but it has to be bent northward in order to get on that great circle route. And of course, with the ionization here, the ionization is going to try to bend it the other direction. It's going to bend it into, into Europe and Africa. And so there's no way to take the northern route and get a signal that it would be bent to the north onto a great circle route going to Cocos Keeling Island. And so that's the reason why you don't have uh, you know, any, any kind of uh, path to the north at sunset, for example, is always you know, southeast at sunset. And this, this theory at least would explain why that is. Um, the signal has to be refracted to the pole and it works uh, to get onto the Cocos Keeling Great Circle. And the ionization up there at the pole is bending it the wrong way. It's bending it over into Europe and into Africa. And so it's, it's not sending it where you need to go. So that's, that's the reason, the fundamental reason why that's the case. So as I say, it um, explains the southeast at sunset, southwest at sunrise experience. And the reason it does this is it's purely geography, because almost all the gray line DX is north of the antipode for US operators. You know, there's not a whole lot south of Cocos Keeling. Um, it also ex explains why the north-south gray line paths are, quote, you know, never un experienced, unquote. You know, the, there's always been this sort of a puzzle if, it, if, the, if there's some sort of uh, propagation along the, the gray line, you know, in, in why, for example, do you not work stations in South America? Why is it always only on the other side of the world? You'd think if the, if the signal was, was traveling along the gray line, along the terminator, that you'd have a chance to to contact you know, somebody else along the way, but it's only way on the other side of the world. And this would be why. And when we did all this back in 2013, I realized that it could be tested. And that was the Amsterdam Island de expedition. And I played around a little bit with some uh, some uh, global models, and uh, found that there'd be a gray line situation existing for uh, Houston, Texas, in for the uh, FT5 Zulu Mike D expedition, and it would be interesting to see if that, you know, if if stations along the line between. Uh, Houston and the FT5 Zulu Mike antipode, which turns out to be in the extreme southeast corner of Colorado. If those if those stations discovered that they they worked FT5 from the north and the northeast instead of from the uh, the southeast at sunset, if they if they worked in northeast at sunset instead of southeast at sunset, that would support this theory because in this case, because uh, Amsterdam Island is south of their antipode, the signal, you know, the situation is totally reversed, and then they need to go to the north, and they can't go to the south. And so I asked everybody who I could find uh, to take care of the, to take note of the, the, the uh, direction in which you heard uh, Amsterdam Island, and to my great frustration, I never got a real, a real straightforward answer. <laughs> so this test is still essentially open. Um, 
I don't know if we might have the chance with Heard Island, I don't know, but it, it, Heard Island is so far south that it's possible we may get to the point where there's, you know, other effects take place, you know, it's too, it may end up being too close to the, the polar ionization, we, we'll have to see how that works. So, um, what I expected to happen with Amsterdam was uh, stations on the gray line would see uh, signals approaching from the northeast and um, stations away from the gray line would see uh, more conventional propagation th through the dark ionosphere and that's because their great circle routes, their short pass and long pass are exactly, you know, through, go through the ionosphere and they wouldn't need to take advantage of this mechanism. Um, another test is one that can literally be done every year and I've just, I just plain don't talk enough to enough people to know the answer and that is there ought to be um, examples of gray line propagation in the southern hemisphere. Uh, guys in Brazil talking to uh, the Philippines, you know, a, a PY3 running it, working a DU6. And in that case, those people in the southern hemisphere should experience a northeast at sunset and northwest at sunrise uh, uh, condition. So I'm, I'm eager to listen to someone that has, that has uh, that experience, that has a case where uh, in especially southern Brazil, if you if you can uh, uh, hear the Philippines uh, to the to the northeast uh, at sunset, I would very much like to to hear cases of that because this is this is the same environment where you have to have a signal you have to have the signal go and be bent towards the towards the equator through the auroral ionization to get down to the Philippines, and it would be interesting to see if uh, anyone's had any experience with that. So, <clears throat> and this again because of the same reason that the antipode is north of the DX instead of south. So, I would be remiss with if I didn't uh, put in a list of the assumptions that I, at least the ones that I know I made in the hypothesis here, which is that uh, the auroral oval ionization is in fact as described and does close the EF duct and does refract it. Um, that the path really was to the south-southeast and not south-southwest here in South Florida. Um, and that there actually was the path to the south-southwest at Cocos Keeling because we don't have any data because it was a straight vertical antenna. So, you know, actually it's possible that EF duct propagation itself is a theory that's never been totally verified to my knowledge. So I wanted to put these out as just uh, caveats that um, I'm willing to uh, uh, willing to discuss. So, uh, with that, I believe that's the last slide I have, and I want to thank you all for listening and uh, return the meeting back over to Ken, I think. Okay, <clears throat> very good, Ed. Thank you much. So if you got uh, questions, now's the uh, time to go ahead and send those in to us, and uh, we'll pass them along to Ed. We've got a uh, little bit of time left here. So uh, go ahead and just uh, put it in the question box and hit send, and uh, I'll pick it up here and forward it on to him. Um, we do have one question, which I will uh, pass along. I'm not real sure what slide this was. I didn't catch the numbers you were going along, but... Uh, um, uh, in the three scenario, uh, you had paths were shown as lines. He said, but the waves expand spherically as they travel. Would that make the blue path eventually overlap the red path at, I guess, number four? Um, you were talking about, I don't know if you remember which slide it was, but you had a red and a blue path uh, as you were showing to the southeast. I think maybe that was the slide. So he's wondering, uh, in, in that case, if the waves expand sphere, spherically, let's see, yeah, okay. All right, in number three, uh, the scenario of the paths are shown as lines, but the waves expand spherically as they travel from number one. Would that make the blue path eventually overlap the red path at number four? That's the question, if that makes sense. 
Yeah, I'm thinking of a sensible answer. Um, I guess the 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 quick answer is I never say nothing. Whatever, I, ne I never say never. <laughs> um, but it but it is true that the the signals are, are going to path are going to travel in a direction. Um, and they'll be attenuated when they move off of these off of these uh, directions. Um, if you look at all of the paths that uh, a signal can take from South Florida, and if you if you put all of the paths on them to in for BRF, um, they all go to its antipode. In other words, if you t if you took took the world and you sliced it up in every possible angle uh, between the South Florida and its antipode, uh, those would make a whole bunch of things that look sort of like sine waves on this kind of map. Um, the only ones that would pass through, I mean, that's it's true that yes, they would go in a lot of different directions. The trouble is the only ones that would go to Cocos Keeling are the ones that are directly very, very close to the to the terminator or actually in the sun side. Um, so the, the the problem I mean, yes that's true, but the problem the problem is they don't go to the right direction. They don't go in the right place. Um, if you take if you take a signal from N4 BRF and it spreads out, this is not exactly the best map to see that, but they the signals will spread out, but the only ones that will actually reach uh, VK9CZ are the ones that are unlikely to make it through the through the daylight. For example, if you took if you took a signal, um, I guess if the question is if you're at if you're at point three on the map, and the, are there if the signal that you put on on the blue line and you kept it there, um, would it ever? I guess the 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 the, uh, the short answer is no, it wouldn't, because it would just stay on the blue line. I don't I don't think there's. It's it's not like the signal is is just going to to spread forever. I'm, I'm I realize I'm I'm rambling a long time because I'm not really sure what the question is, what the point of the question is exactly. If so we could have another go at it, I'd appreciate it. Okay, very good. Um, let's uh, move on. Uh, Chris has got a question. Uh, he said, in your investigation, did you glean any insight into what we call spotlight propagation on the low bands? <laughs> uh, not a whole lot, but uh, just to the extent that I, th I the working hypothesis, and I'm not the one that created this. This is someone else, someone else's work. Is that the spotlight is is uh, just a region of low ionization in the E layer, and if you happen to be underneath it, you know it shines down on you, and it's the spotlight. You know the the the, the EF duct is open, the the bottom layer of it is open, and the signal plops on you. And if it's if it's if that hole is not over you, then you don't hear it. Uh, but that's the that's the working hypothesis. I haven't uh, I haven't done any specific work on that, and I'm not sure exactly how you would prove that one way or the other. Okay. Uh, well, here's one from the master himself, Carl K9 LA. <laughs> he says, respect with uh, to the south southwest at sunrise, and south southeast at sunset for North America. I'm pretty sure uh, N4 India Sugar, uh, JC will confirm that South America is backwards. He says this comes from his discussions with the uh, Papa Yankees, the guys in Brazil, so pass that yeah. along. Yeah, I, I sort of expect that's what it has to be. It, ha it has to be that way, but I don't have um, you know, a, lot, a lot of uh, specific data. I don't have contacts and a lot of, you know, a list of contacts made and that type of thing because it, it, it really it has to be that way if, if this uh, if because if this theory doesn't work then we have to think of a new one and I'm open to suggestions <laughs> okay 
Uh, Randy's asking, is the duct always there for the signal to find again after the southern aurora closes? Uh, and the duct then reflects, refracts the signal, I'm sorry. I, I guess the, think, the thinking here is that it's, if you, it's, it's not that the, that the, the duct goes away if, if you continue southward. But remember, by the time it's the time the the signal has reached the the, the poles, it, it's traveling almost uh, uh, parallel to the the auroral ovals. I mean, it's it's a, a not not appro it's not approaching that wall if you think of it as 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 a wall. It's not approaching it at a very acute angle. It's almost approaching it as a as a uh, you know two two things par parallel to each other sort of tangential to each other and so it, it does it's not that the that the the duct disappears it's more like it gets bent a little bit and starts slowly curving backwards the way you know it came you know it came from the north and just because of the geometry of the situation it, it it's it's almost parallel to the rural ionization when it hits the you know the 60 or 70 degrees southern latitude, and then that just bit gently curves it back again, and so it's it's curving without um, ever leaving the duct. It stays in the duct. It's just that as you approach one end of the duct, um, the du the duct itself is closed, but you're only approaching it at this really small angle, and so you just refract back again. In fact, I think that's probably one of the case, one of the reasons the the opening is is really small. Is is I think in certainly in the northern regions is is the all of the angles involved with how it makes that I think are going to be really critical. Okay, uh, I've got a remark here from Regine. Is pronouncing that right, and I'm going to see if you've got any comments on this or if this is. Uh, what you found as well. Uh, to get inside the duct, your takeoff angle must be lower than 40 degrees and your signal gets stronger with a lower angle. I, I don't know about 40 degrees, though, but uh, what the specific cases are, but it's, it's definitely true that, that uh, at least in the models I was playing with, uh, you did have to stay under, under 20 degrees to get, to get the, uh, a signal into the duct reliably. So it really did pay off to have a low uh, angle of takeoff. Okay, and uh, Chris GM3WOJ is with us live and uh, says uh, thanks. <laughs> all right. Um, well, well, let's, th let's all thank Chris. Without which it wouldn't have <laughs> it wouldn't have been possible. And he says we'll be looking for every, everyone from uh, Victor Six Zulu soon. So, okay. Well, that's it for the questions. Ed, uh, anything else you want to pass along before we wrap it up? No, thank you, everybody else, for listening. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, thank you, Ed, uh, for taking the time to put together the uh, presentation. Very detailed, and I'm, I know it took a lot of work, and uh, glad you could uh, join us. And thank you, everyone, uh, for being here, and also to the uh, Worldwide Radio Operators Foundation for uh, sponsoring this event. And I'm working on some uh, upcoming events uh, with uh, some great presentations. We're still uh, working out dates. Guys are putting the presentations together, and uh, we'll have some dates here, um, I think, probably in April. Uh, have, have some more. So with that, thank you, everyone, for being here. Thanks again, Ed. Um, everyone take care. We'll see you next time. 73s. Bye-bye.